Good evening. Good evening. Um, welcome. Um, welcome to the second of the Marshall Institute lectures. Um, and welcome back to those of you who were here um, last week. We have a treat for you this evening. Um, we're continuing our thread of talks on philanthropy and social entrepreneurship. And you will remember that last week we crystallized two or three, I think, quite important threads of our conversation. Um, one was about co-creation. One was about thinking about the people on whose behalf we claim to speak. Second was a kind of humility, a kind of, a kind of provisional sense that sometimes we make interventions without knowing enough to make them decisively. Um, the third was what I think of as the morality of small choices, or the fact that you have philanthropic capital in your own identities which you can spend over the course of a working lifetime as you choose, better or less informed. Um, and the last, and the one that speaks absolutely directly to what we're doing tonight, um, was the importance of evidence, knowledge, rationality, understanding, communication, all of those good things that we believed in this time last Tuesday. Um, somebody laughed. Somebody, somebody knew what I was talking about. Um, this week, we're going to talk about maximizing the good you can do, or in the much catchier expression, doing good better. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have as our guest, um, William McCaskill, um, whose CV is rather extraordinary. He co-founded with Peter Singer and Toby Ord the Effective Altruism Movement. He co-founded 80,000 Hours, which we talked about very briefly in passing last week, and you might um, hear a little bit more about. Um, he co-founded Giving What We Can, um, he's the author of Doing Good Better, um, and as an ex-publisher, I can't resist saying, if you haven't read it yet, read it. If you haven't bought it yet, buy it. If you've bought it and not read it, read it. Um, he's a fellow of Lincoln College, Oxford, um, and he's a philosopher. Um, and he knows quite a lot about things like causal decision theory and evidential decision theory. And I suspect you're not going to hear a lot about some of the more technical elements of philosophy. He's going to talk for half an hour. We're going to talk to one another for you for 20 minutes. Then you're going to ask us questions. Okay. You're very welcome. Thank you for yeah. coming. Thanks so much. <laughs> Okay, thank you for coming here tonight. Can you hear me all okay? Yeah, okay. With one exception. So this is a talk about um, trying to do the most good we can do. And I'm going to start this talk with a graph. Um, what I think, in fact, is the most important graph you'll probably ever see in your life. Uh, this is the graph of the income distribution in the world. So this is the graph that you get when you take everyone in the world and line them up in order of how much income they have. So the very poorest person is here, and the very richest person is over here. Um, and now I've been rather devious um, in this graph. I've left off the y-axis. So we don't yet know um, where we are. But most of us know that inequality in the world is a really pretty big deal. Um, and in fact, this graph shows the world is an incredibly unequal place. If the world were perfectly equal, then this graph wouldn't be this crazy exponential. It would be a neat rectangle with everyone at the same level of income. But it's not this neat rectangle. It's incredibly unequal. The very poorest people have a very small amount of money, and the very richest people have a huge amount of money. In fact, if I wanted to complete this graph so that it really represented everyone in the world, um, the graph would have to be as tall as Mount Everest. In fact, a little bit taller. Uh, now, the second question is, where are you on this graph? Um, members of the audience, um, if you're a student, think about, well, when I start earning, where will I be? And most people, when they see this graph, they think, OK, I know I'm in a rich country. 
I'm, you know, not like really terribly off by global standards. But I'm not like the CEOs and the financiers, the hedge fund managers. I'm not part of this real elite, the kind of 1%. So they normally say, well, I may be about here. I'm kind of not as poorly, or badly off as the very poorest people in the world, but not as wealthy, or, as, wealthy as the very richest people. Um, when we actually now put the labels in this, we see that's not correct. Um, basically, every single member of this room um, at least once you start earning, will find yourself in the richest one to two percent of the world's population. So you know there was this Occupy movement. It was all about criticizing, casting light on the one percent um, as indicative of global inequality and how um, bad inequality was. But what I think a lot of people don't realize is that, again, basically everyone in this room um, is or will be in the richest one percent. If you're earning above about thirty-five thousand pounds per year um, as an individual, that's enough to put you in the richest one percent. Um, and then in contrast, look at the bottom 700 million people who are living on less than $1.90 per day. Normally when people think about this, they think, oh, well, $1.90, or that's the latest figure you might have heard of $1 per day previously. Uh, they think, well, it's okay because the money goes so much, so much further overseas. You know, you can buy so much more in uh, Kenya or Ethiopia or other areas of sub-Saharan Africa, sub Africa. But what this figure actually means there's at the bottom what 700 million people live on the equivalent of what um, $1.90 could buy in the United States. So it's already taken into account the fact that money has gone further overseas. Um, and if you think about what could that buy, it's like a couple of bags of rice or something. That's what people have to live on every day. Um, it also takes into account consumption. So you might think, well, people grow their own food, um, and that, you know, that's not counted by this number. So people can't really be as badly off as that. But again, that $1.90 is what's called consumption expenditure. Someone goes out um, to the forest, gathers some sticks, someone scavenges from the dump. That counts as part of this $1.90. So the lesson from this is that the world is this incredibly unequal place. Um, and most talks kind of end that would kind of maybe end there. Most talks say, hey, there's this huge problem in the world. We should do something about it. Um, whereas for the talk I'm going to give and then the conversation afterwards, and the whole point of effective altruism is rather than just saying, like, look, this is this terrible problem, instead saying, look, what can we actually do about it? Because it, absolutely, this is like something that's really astonishing and unfair about the world. But we in this audience are the people who are the lucky ones who have happened to found us, find ourselves at the top of the heap. This gives us this enormous opportunity to be able to help other people in the world just by using some of our resources wisely. And effective altruism is about saying, given that we have this responsibility and given that we have this opportunity, how can we use our money and our time as effectively as possible to help others? How can we rely on evidence and careful reasoning in order to ensure that we don't just do a bit of good, we don't just symbolically try to help other people, but we actually do the most good we can? And this is crucially important because very often we actually fail to live up to the good intentions we have. And so the case study I'll give is the play pump. Um, so the play pump was designed in the late 1990s um, by a man named Trevor Pear. Um, and he had previously been in journalism and advertising, and then when he discovered this, he thought, yes, this is it. This is my guiding passion. I've got to, I've got to work on this thing. It just seems like genius. And what it is is a technology that is a playground merry-go-round, so the sort of thing you'll see in children's playgrounds, that doubles as a water pump. So children play on this thing, they spin it round, and the force from children's play pumps clean water up from the ground to fill a reservoir um, far up above the ground to provide clean water for the community of a village. Um, and once this was developed and started to be rolled out, it really took off in a big way. Um, in two, the year 2000, it won a World Bank Development Media Marketplace Award, um, so kind of really quite a great honor. Uh, the media just really loved it. They loved to pun on the name. They called it the magic roundabout. They said that pumping water was child's play. Um, it took off with celebrities as well. So um, Bill Clinton called it a wonderful innovation. Uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce got behind it with their Water for Life tour. Um, and then this all culminated really in an announcement from the Clinton Global Initiative the first lady of the time, Laura, Laura Bush, announced 
along with the Case Foundation, they would give it $17 million to roll out this thing um, across many countries across sub-Saharan Africa. So it just seemed like this win-win. Children would get their first playground amenity, and um, the local community would get you know, clean water source. What could possibly be wrong with that? Well, there was just one problem with the play pump, and that, that it was that it was a terrible idea. <laughs> just absolutely rotten from the start. Um, and there were many ways in which it was a really bad idea. So one of which is, um, unlike a normally merry-go-round, like the reason it's fun is that you push it, and then it spins freely. But in order to pump clean water up from the ground, it, this thing needs constant torque. So children get very tired, and they wouldn't want to play on this thing. Um, in some villages, they would get paid to play on the pump. Um, but much more often was that uh, it would be left up to the elderly women of the, of the local community to push this thing, this you know, brightly colored children's toy. And this is a task they'd find, find very undignified and undemean undemeaning. Um, and they would say they actually much preferred the Zimbabwe bush pumps that um, these things actually often replaced. Um, not only that, um, it was actually just a lot less effective than really standard hand pumps. So it would pump um, about half as much water. One estimate suggested that to provide for the needs of a typical community, this would have to be pumped 25 hours a day. Um, uh, it would break very often. It was very hard to maintain, unlike a Zimbabwe bush pump. Um, and then worst thing of all, uh, it cost three times as much. So people were getting something they didn't even want in the first place um, that was a far inferior product, but yet cost so much more. Yet this thing really took off. It was huge. Everyone loved it. And the reason was because it was this sexy, gimmicky idea, not because it was actually helpful. And so this is a rare story where people actually um, realized the mistake. Um, you know, they, all, there were a couple of investigations by UNICEF and a Swiss consultancy group. This all came to light. Um, and the Case Foundation admitted it and made a big mistake with through the funding, which is really pretty unusual. But it is still the case that Play Pumps International continues in a, albeit much diminished capacity, um, but funded by companies like Colgate Palmolive and um, Ford Motor Company. So this is an example of how badly things can go wrong. And this isn't actually a, an isolated incident. It's not like a rare incident. Um, I think actually in general, when we try and have an impact, socially speaking, most of the time we achieve um, almost nothing. Um, in one study, by one expert, um, there was a suggestion that when tested programs in the US, about 75% of social programs had no positive impact at all. Um, and that's a real shame, because the very most effective ways of doing good are extraordinarily powerful. Um, we can actually do really amazing things with a very small amount of money, but only if we spend that money wisely. So my next exhibit is the eradication of smallpox. Um, and this, I think, was one of humanity's greatest ever achievements. So in the 20th century, smallpox killed 300 million people. It's probably the disease that's killed more people than any other disease. Um, yet we managed to eradicate it in 1973. And just, for con like, just to really get the scale of how bad smallpox was, um, it killed about 300 million people in the 20th century. That's more than all wars, all political famines, all terrorist acts, all genocides combined, even despite the gulags, Mao's Great Leap Forward, World I and World War II. Yet we managed to eradicate it, and in the course of doing so, we saved more lives than world peace would have done over the last um, four decades. Um, so that saved about between 60 and 120 million lives. But what's really um, astonishing in particular about this is also just how cheap it was. So we saved between 60 and 120 million lives. And the cost for the entire eradication program was only about $1.4 billion in the money of today. Um, that means that we've got a cost per life saved of something like $10, $20, which is this astonishingly if, like, good use of money. This was a disease that, and that was only talking about lives saved, not about the pain endured during death, because smallpox would often kill people um, by forming, the well, blisters would form a sheet over people's skin and body, and it would become so painful that people would die of shock. Um, and obviously the disfigurement as well. 
And yet we managed to eradicate it for such a small amount of money. Um, and so the question the effective altruists ask themselves are, how can we find the things today that are much more like smallpox eradication and less like the play pump? And so we can, there's a variety of um, research that we can draw on from health and development ec economics. And we can use a metric called the quality adjusted life year, um, at least to compare among different sorts of health programs, where one quality adjusted life year is um, a way I can benefit you that comprises two different forms of benefit. So I can save your life, means extending your life, which is a good thing to do if you have um, a good life already, or I can improve the quality of your life. I can, um, if you're in ill health, then I can make your life better off. So you know, if you suffer from migraines, for example, that's not gonna, or back pain, that's not gonna shorten your life, but it is gonna make your life worse while you are alive. The quality adjusted life year combines both of these things into one metric. And so Kaposi sarcoma is an AIDS-defining cancer. It's a sort of skin cancer. And um, spending money in order to treat that is like a pretty good use of money. It's, I'd definitely be willing to spend it on myself. It provides one quality-adjusted life year of about 30,000 pounds. In comparison, the National Health Service, um, they use this metric of the quality-adjusted life year. They are willing to spend, um, they're willing to fund a treatment or some sort of procedure if it costs less than 20,000 pounds. I mean, they might fund it if it's more, but if it costs less than 20,000 pounds, they're definitely gonna fund this thing. And so, Kaposi's sarcoma is the sort of thing that's on the borderline for them. But we can, as we can see here, we can do a lot better. Antiretroviral therapy, um, we're doing about 10 times as much good with the same amount of money. So we have exactly the same amount of resources, but just by focusing on a different sort of treatment, we can um, provide 10 times as much benefit, 10 times as much improvements to people's lives. Um, but we can do even better again. So this is a way of preventing um, HIV from transmission from mother to child um, uh, through use of drugs. And again, we can do several times as much good again. Um, um, again, measured in terms of just how many people are we affecting and by how much are we benefiting them. But we can go better again. If we, th using this metric, we don't need to just look at uh, differences between different sorts of HIV AIDS programs. We can look at all sorts of different health programs at least. And so the final one I'll consider is distribution of long-lasting insecticide treated bed nets, which is going to do several times as much good again. Um, so at this point, we're really doing, an ex like, for comparison, this line, which is what the NHS is willing to spend, you know, the line below which it will definitely fund something because it's such a good use of money, we can barely even distinguish that from zero because these other ways of spending money are just so much better than improving people's lives. Um, at this point, we're doing, um, we're, like, statistically speaking, saving a life for about a couple of thousand pounds. Um, so it's really, like, it's not as good as smallpox. That was really unbelievably exceptional. But we still have an unbelievable opportunity to do a huge amount of good. Um, so this is the kind of one of the charities that implements this, the one that's like very highly recommended by um, GiveWell, a charity evaluator in the effective altruist space. Um, if you donate 2,000 pounds, you're going to distribute 700 bed nets to protect about 1,400 children. And statistically speaking, on average, you're going to save one of those children's lives. So you've got this opportunity to do this huge amount of good. Um, it's also just worth kind of reflecting on that. So normally, I don't think we really think about the world in these terms. So we normally think if you can just save kind of one life, imagine if you just did that in your life, that would make you this unbelievable hero, like this guy, if he comes up. There we go. See, isn't he? What, what here though? Save the, kind of save the dog's life. But um, really, like everybody in this room can do far, far more good than this. Um, I mean, think about it in your own case. Imagine you're walking down the street, you see a burning building, you kick the door down, you run in, there's a small child inside, and you save that child's life. You know, that, you'd feel pretty special if you did that. You'd, that would kind of stay with you over the course of your life. You think, wow, this is a kind of. You know, this was an important moment in my own life. And then if you imagine you did this kind of several times um, over the course of your life. One point you save a child from a burning building, another time you rescue someone from drowning, 
third time you take a bullet for someone, well, then you'd think, wow, I've really had this like, really pretty special life. I feel really pretty pleased with myself. Well, what the numbers show is just that you can do that every single year of your life, basically, once you're learning, simply by a decision to spend your money in a somewhat different way than you would have otherwise spent it. Really, at very little sacrifice to yourself. So this kind of line of argument, line of reasoning, led me and um, another philosopher, Toby Ord, to set up um, an organization called Giving What We Can, which is about encouraging people to give at least 10% of their income to the most effective charities, whatever you think is most effective, but also doing research and making recommendations um, on that basis, uh, where every member takes a 10% pledge. So now we've got over 2,000 members around the world that's pledged about $800 million um, for the most effective charities. Um, and we make recommendations based on um, GiveWell, with charity evaluators' recommendations. So against Malaria Foundation, we've talked about um, a couple of deworming charities, just as a Myosin Control Initiative and Deworm the World, that we might talk about a little bit later. And then also give directly that simply transfers cash um, to the very poorest um, people in the world. Um, so that's kind of one p major part of effective altruism, which is the focus on charitable giving. Um, it's definitely not the whole of it, because um, effective altruism is about how can you use your time and money um, to do the most good. And there's many ways of doing good. It doesn't have to be through charity. And so another organization I co-founded is 80,000 Hours, which encourages people to pursue careers that are going to have the biggest possible positive impact and to figure out what are those careers that are going to have the biggest impact. It provides the search and advice on this. So in terms of thinking about how you can have the biggest impact in your career, you can think about it as impact in the short term, impact in the long, long term. And I'll talk about this just only very briefly, talk about the different causes, effective altruism so incident only very briefly, and we can take questions. Um, so in terms of impact on the job, one thing to bear in mind is just we often think about the direct impact only, but like you know, working at a nonprofit, the good that you might do through that nonprofit, but that's not the only way of doing good. Um, you can also advocate. So you know, Martin Luther King wasn't didn't work for the charity, he was a minister, but that gave him this platform to inspire many others. Or you can do good through philanthropy, through your ability to pay other people to do good work, such as through nonprofits. And then the second thing that we think is like more neglected often when people are thinking about their career path is just the fact that your first jobs are going to contribute only a very small amount to the total impact you have in your life. Biggest impact is going to have later on simply because you're going to be working more hours, more years, um, and because you're going to be in more senior positions. So that's why we think it's crucial early on to start building skills, credentials, to try and keep your doors open as much as possible, and also to try and learn as much as you can about yourself and where you'll be able to have the biggest impact. So within that, we actually tend to not very often recommend work in nonprofits, unless they're really very good indeed. Um, but we do recommend entrepreneurship, going into certain areas of research, um, certain areas in policy as well, as well as working for some effective nonprofits or for profits. So, giving just a few examples of this. So, this is Matt who chose this path called Earning to Give, where he deliberately, so you know, he was considering doing a philosophy PhD, asked Peter, the philosopher Peter Singer whether he should do it, and Peter said, no, don't become a moral philosopher, it's a terrible idea. Um, so, instead, he's you know, working for a quantitative trading firm. I don't think it's the most socially valuable thing directly. I don't think it's harmful either. Um, and in doing so, he donates half of his earnings. Um, and just a few years out of college, he's donated well over a million dollars as a result of doing this, able to pay for far more people working at the organizations um, than the single person that he would have been if he had worked at that organization. Um, Lincoln Quirk's an example of um, uh, a kind of social entrepreneur, co-founded an organization called Sendwave, um, which makes it cheaper. So at the moment, I mean, remittances are a far bigger deal, globally speaking, than aid. Um, it amounts to several times as much, about half a trillion dollars um, every year. And um, if you wanted to send remittances from, say, the US back to US to Kenya, you had to go to a Western Union, it would cost 10%. They made it far cheaper, it cost only 2 to 3%. Um, and you could do it phone to phone. 
Um, they've already moved millions of dollars through this. The potential impact of this company is in the billions. Um, and it was had, had to be done as a company because you can't do it as a non-profit. You can't take investment. You can't grow as fast. Um, final example is Ava Vivolt. Um, she's gone into the research direction, work in development econ economics. So what she's working on in part is this question of just if you're doing studies in order to work out what's the impact of these different sorts of programs, um, how much do they generalize? How much do you actually learn about a general fact um, if you find out that something is or isn't effective um, in a particular instance? Like, if something works in one country, what's the chance of it working in another? And she's already actually made pretty big contributions there. And of course, that's vitally important because the only way we can actually even start thinking about how to, we can do the most good is if we've got people gathering this sort of information and evidence. Um, so the final way, then, in which I'll talk about how effective altruism is kind of broadening and approaching different subject matter um, is in terms of different cause areas. So I focused almost entirely on global poverty. And this kind of makes sense. If you're trying to do the most good, you want to focus on the poorest people in the world. It would be a very nat natural leap. Um, but it's plausible, at least, there could be ways of doing good that are even better outside of this. Um, and this is the Open Philanthropy Project, um, not run by me, but by others. But it's going to take this approach of saying, well, in cases where we can't measure the impact as well, um, but in cause areas outside of this, what could be the most effective uses of money? And trying to be, have as high standards for rationality and scientific rigor and careful thought applied to these different cause areas. Um, and they advise a very large foundation um, that's kind of come on board um, as part of the effective altruism movement. And they assess different causes in terms of these criteria. Scale, just how big is the problem, how many people are affected by it, and how much. Um, tractability, so with a given amount of effort, how much progress are you actually going to make towards this problem? Um, because there can be some very big problems. Maybe you might think, you know, death is this really big problem. It affects all of us. Um, but you might think work to try and... Um, Stop it is kind of futile, it's kind of uh, tilting at windmills. Um, so it's obviously we want to focus on problems where we can actually make significant progress. And then finally, neglectedness, because even if you've got a program that's highly um, big in scale and actually very tractable, if other people are already completely dealing with it, you're not going to have much of an impact adding up on top. So polio eradication being one example where there's already huge amounts of funding going into that. Gates Foundation have you know, vowed that it will keep funding it until it's eradicated, um, even though it's a very effective thing to do. As an individual, kind of adding on to that, you're not going to have as big an impact. And so I'll just very briefly sketch some of the things that they've, the causes that they've decided to focus on, without kind of giving too much justification, but we can talk about it more. So as well as global poverty, there's factory farming. Um, here, again, just looking at scale involved. So I, mean, I think everyone should agree that unnecessary cruelty to animals is bad. Um, if you saw me torturing a cat or a dog, you'd think I was a, a monster. But yet 50 billion animals are killed and raised in really like atrocious, really horrific conditions um, every single year. Um, and there's almost nothing. So it's very great in scale. Um, and there's actually almost no charitable work, like really very little charitable work, focused on this 50 billion animals. There's, a fair amount on animals used in experiments, but it's actually a far smaller number. Um, a third is immigration reform. It's been a focus area um, where, as well as the fact that, you know, it seems like... So, um, for many, many people, the way that they've escaped poverty is not by anything in their own country, but just by leaving, going to a country with better institutions where they can use their labor in a way that... Um, has a bigger positive impact. So taxi driver driving in Kenya or driving in New York is doing exactly the same job, but you get paid 20 times as much if you're in New York. Um, and is this kind of bizarre fact about the world that labor is so restricted to cross borders? Everyone's now very um, accepting of the idea that, of course, you know, free trade of goods. It would be crazy if we just banned the import of goods from um, all other countries. Just um, be economic insanity. Yet, people are perfectly happy with this idea that we drastically restrict the flow of um, labor across um, countries. And some economists, at least, estimate that this could increase 
um, global wealth by 50%, as well as um, eliminating a very large part of extreme poverty. Criminal justice reform, another example. This is something, this is based in the US. Um, this is one of the kind of rarer cases of a very high priority cause that um, is based in a rich country. And the reason is, so in the US, that they incarcerate about 10 times as many people um, as comparable countries, so Canada, UK, Japan, even per, per, per capita. So about 2 million people in the US are in prison at any one time. It's unbelievably high. And yet also it seems like a particularly ripe political opportunity, both the left and the right um, in the US. So perhaps this isn't true in the last week, actually, but um, sadly. Uh, but up until recently, there was this kind of agreement, bipartisan agreement, that really this needed to change. And so this was an unusually tractable area, um, and also fairly neglected, even if it perhaps wasn't as big in scale as some of these other problems. And then the final area that's sort of definitely a big focus is concerns improving the lives of people um, in the kind of long run future and worrying about um, lower probability risks that we could very severely destroy, damage or destroy civilization. Um, the reason this could potentially be so great in scale is because the vast number of people um, who have lived, do live, or will ever live exist in the future. Um, really, the kind of, we should think of ourselves as only at the start of a very long journey, which is the human race. Um, and I mean, I often give the example of if you look at my book, represent everyone who ever lived by the first word in that book, represent everyone now by the first letter of the second word, the whole rest of the book would represent people um, who will exist in the future. Um, and that's actually under some quite conservative assumptions. So there's potentially huge numbers of people in the future, yet we're now getting to the level of technological progress um, where even though technology in general is of massive benefit to the world, it also poses these grave risks. Um, so there's you know, nuclear weapons and climate change are the two that ways of our increasing prosperity that have the potential to um, cause real catastrophe. But I think there's others as well that are even more neglected, um, like our ability to design um, novel pathogens, um, where it's really just in the horizon. Like some labs could probably already do this, but certainly over the next couple of decades, you're going to be able to design a virus that could affect, infect everybody um, in the world without anyone even knowing um, with a virus that could kill you um, and would have a fatality rate of kind of 99%. So it's really possible that we're going to get the sort of technology that could wreak havoc on a very global scale. But because um, these things aren't here yet, involves kind of thinking you know, 10 years into the future, 20 years into the future, gets very little attention indeed. Um, you know, markets don't care about it. Um, governments think on a four-year time, timeline, five-year timeline. And so it's, again, another ripe area for people engaging in altruism more. Um, uh, philanthropy to be trying to tackle this. Okay, so that was a bit of a whirlwind tour. Before we get on to questions, I'll just briefly mention the sorts of things you can do if you really want to have an, an impact right away. So the easiest way to have a really big impact in your life is to take the Giving What We Can pledge. So here's the web address. Um, it's making, say, you donate 1% of what you're living on as a student because um, technically you don't have an income yet. And then once you start earning, donate 10% per year. Um, it's the single, simplest, easiest decision you can make in your life to have an absolutely huge positive impact <laughs> if you want literally saving hundreds of lives over your life. Um, if you want to learn more, there's, um, you'd have to go to Oxford for this, but there's an 80,000 hours workshop where you can learn about, um, learn about the different ways you can have a really big impact in your career. That's this Friday. There's actually a conference as well. Um, 18th to 20th, so this weekend, um, based in Oxford. So again, you can look that up, and if you want to find out a lot more about these things, you can go there. And then in terms, the final thing, I think, is getting involved with the local groups here. So there's now 100 local effective altruism groups around the world, um, effective altruism London, and based at the LSE itself. And this is just, this has got to be the highest value opportunity to, you have to volunteer that you'll ever get. So... If you think about how much good you can do by taking the 10% pledge, let's say that's 
as good as saving 100 lives over the course of your life. Well, imagine the course of helping out with this local group. You can get two of your peers to take the pledge. You know, if you even get one, that's doubling your life's impact. That's, again, every single person you get, that's another um, 100 lives saved. Um, so the potential you have just by influencing your peers, people here who are going to be very influential in the course of their life, is absolutely huge indeed. So here are a few ways that you can have a yeah, really huge impact in your life. Right. Um, first, thank you. Um, you are the first and only, I suspect, philosopher who's ever committed to speaking for 30 minutes, who's then spoken for 30 minutes. Oh, good. <laughs> so thank you very much. And thank you for speaking so um, directly to the kinds of things that, that uh, we care about in this institute and this group. Um, with your permission, I'm going to ask Will some questions. And I'm going to try to represent some of the things that I think people typically want to ask you or typically don't quite get. And then we're going to open the floor to your questions as we did last week. So start thinking about the kinds of things you want to ask. Um, let, me let me check that I've got this right. All other things being equal, it would not be advisable for me to give money to a donkey sanctuary <laughs> when I could instead follow one of these prescriptions. Um, have I followed you so far? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Okay. If, for me, just narrowly defined, donkeys are the single most important mm -hmm. thing in my life. Okay. It has some value to me to feel that I am saving donkeys. Okay. How, how, do you, how do you allow for my, the donors, feeling better about myself because I feel better about donkeys on this, let's yeah. call it, hyper-rational model? Okay, yeah, great question. I mean, so on the question of the donkey sanctuary in particular, it's definitely got to be one of the worst charities out there. I mean, um, like, it's incredibly well-funded. They have three years of reserves. So even if they didn't get any donations, they could still operate for three years. Um, apparently, they go around old folks' homes trying to get people to donate in their will. Um, and also, we just don't have any donkeys in this country. So they actually have to import donkeys from Spain. Um, also, it wasn't a setup that you asked me about this, but um, it, it, it really wasn't a setup. <laughs> um, but the general question of, well, what about your personal motivation? Like, how much does that matter? I think when it comes to spending your time and spending philanthropy, it's quite different. Um, because the way I think about this, so I mean, I think ultimately, um, I don't really want to give it much weight, kind of intrinsically. Um, most philanthropy or charity is about, well, what do you care about as a donor? Um, what's your, what are your personal passions? Find a cause that fit, fits you. My attitude is, look, there's some huge pressing moral problems out in the world. Um, and sure, we can be like, feel empowered about trying to solve them. But ultimately, our duties are to make the world better, not to kind of pander to our own interests. So I think it is relevant to some extent, but only insofar as that might help you do more good in the long run. Um, so if it's really the case that you think, um, yeah, I'm just not going to do you know, I could be giving to give directly or against Malaria Foundation, but I'm just not going to be very excited about that. I'm probably going to burn out. Then that's fine. Give, you know, you can give to something else. Though bear in mind the difference in impact between these things is, you know, hundreds of times. So even if you thought you were twice as likely to burn out by giving something much less effective, um, it's probably not worth it. You should probably just take that chance and give to the more effective thing. Um, when it comes to your career, things are a little bit, I think, are quite different um, because... Uh, you know, this is something you've got to do with your time every minute of every day for the rest of your life. So there, kind of what are you going to be able to sustain over the very long time period, what you're going to be able to do very well, becomes much more important. Even then, I think the idea of following your passion isn't quite right, um, uh, partly because very few people have work-related passions, actually. Um, there's been surveys done, and only 4% of uh, students have... Um, work-related passions. Most people are passionate about music or art or sports, um, things that's like possible but very difficult. That's not indeed. true here, by the way. It's much more than four percent here. Okay. Well, this that's, might be that's like, an Oxford problem. These were Canadians, <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. Okay. So perhaps in this room, there's um, larger proportion that are passionate about some 
thing. But there's still, and I do think that's going to be relevant. Like, it's definitely relevant about to thinking about, like, well, how much good are you actually going to be able to do? How much are you going to excel? Um, but my understanding, we've done a bunch of investigation into this, especially the psychology literature. And I generally think that claims of following your passion are kind of overblown in this regard. So people tend to have this, what's called the end of history illusion. They think that what I really care about now is what I'm going to care about in 10 years' time. But when I look back at myself, age kind of 20, let's say, um, 19, 10 years ago, uh, it's like, what I was interested in is just radically different. If you could thought that I would get, um, I mean, I was terrified of public speaking, so I thought that I'd be doing something like this, or you know, finding that this rewarding, just be absolutely like, you know, mind blowing to me. So we've got to appreciate at least it will change a lot over time. So. What I'm still going to push you a bit on the donkey sanctuary theme. What about this notion that, that I think we might call positive signaling? Mm -hmm. In other words, if I give a very large amount of money to something that falls without your definition yeah. of a kind of rational intervention, let's call it a donkey sanctuary, just my act of doing that and people observing me doing that releases, um, uh, uh, gives permission, signals that giving mm -hmm. is good. And that of all the people I influence at some level to give, many, some, yeah. even a tiny number, will give according to the precepts that you sketch. Yeah, so I think that that consideration might make giving to the donkey sanctuary worse. Um, and the reason would be, so, OK, I give to the donkey sanctuary. Um, I'm signaling giving is good, so that's like a positive. But I'm also kind of signaling that giving to charities that just aren't really helping people or creatures very much is also good. And then secondly, supposing I do, therefore, you know, on a fundraising campaign on Facebook and so on, get other people giving. Um, there is a phenomenon I call funding cannibalism, which is any time you run a fundraising campaign, it's not the case that all of the money is going to come just de novo or like from money that would have been spent on ice cream or something. Um, the amount of money people spend on charity every year tends to be fixed. About in the UK, 0.7% um, of people's income. In the US, it's 2%. Um, doesn't really tend to change that much year on year. And um, at least to some extent, what people will be doing is donating to this charity that you're fundraising for rather than something they would have otherwise donated to. And again, if there's just these huge differences in impact between different charities, then the bit, that's actually going to be a really big effect because you're not doing very much good at all by donating to the donkey sanctuary, but you are having this harm by taking it away from this kind of portfolio of other charities, some of which might be very effective. So another thing, an another line that I will try <coughs> is that if you subject your giving to this kind of rigor, there is a significant risk that you exclude those things that are not yet mm -hmm. possible to evaluate but that might in future have immense sig significance. So uh, on, a, on, a, um, on a cause base, there was a time when it would have been irrational to, um, to uh, lobby for or act for gay marriage. Yep. Okay. But of course, a s very small number of people did it on apparently irrational grounds. It created momentum which moved more quickly than you might think and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. How, how, does one, how, does, how does this system counter that critique? Yeah, so I think the difficulty, the kind of measure, difficulty of measurement and what you can measure and what you can't measure is just a really big one. Um, and it's a problem for all of us. I mean, just if you want to try and have an impact, then you're going to have to real, like, appreciate that some things we can measure, some things we can't. And I definitely don't want effective altruism to be equated with kind of quantified altruism. So, you know, some of the examples I gave against Malaria Foundation and so on. Even there, that's actually just very hard to measure and be confident in the amount of good you're doing. But there, that's better than others. Um, but that's definitely where the conversation should start, but not where it should end, I think. So, you know, I mentioned at the end this argument that's still very numbers-based, still using highest levels of scientific rigor and um, careful reasoning. That just that, the, you know, the future is really, really big. It's this incredibly important resource. People in the future don't have you know, they don't participate in markets, they don't have a vote, um, they're, um, for that reason, exceptionally disenfranchised. Um, therefore, you know, some of these things that are going to be much harder to quantify, like, um, you know, global, these global catastrophic risks, 
maybe that is the most important cause. You can still, even though I don't think we can measure that in any precise way, you can still start to have a, um, you know, more or less of a rational kind of discussion about this. Um. So last week, um, a number of you heard Professor Nava Ashraf um, talk about the beneficiary at the center of solutions, of what she calls the co-creation of solutions or the, the, or the design of solutions with participants. What space is there in this model? And this is a critique you'll be familiar with mm -hmm. from Agus Deaton and, and others. What space is there for people to help participate in the design of solutions for them? Thinking back to Play Pump, which clearly missed that yeah, step in the, yeah. in the... Yeah, so I think the reason... So, you know, there's a whole scope of different um, sort of development interventions. And one of the thi reasons that I favor either give directly, which is simply transferring cash, or these health programs, is that it's in no way you know, trying to make um, claims about what people ought to be doing or like attempting to influence kind of institutions that um, a government or country has. So in the case of give directly, it's kind of clearest. Just say, look, you just get given a wealth transfer thousand dollars for the household and then you spend the money in however way you like because we're just not going to make any um, claims about how you know it's up to you to figure out what the best way of spending that money is you're in a much better position to figure that out than us and even if we thought we did know it'd be paternalistic to think so um, and then health I think also is like fairly justified by this um, where just basically every like not dying of malaria you know not having a dozen intestinal worms in your gut. Um, these are things that basically everyone in the world kind of wants. And they're just preconditions for doing other stuff. And so, but, but, yeah. But, but that's not, that's an answer to a slightly different question. That's an answer to the question, do people want worms in their gut? Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you make space to ask the people who, who, whose treatment or whose intervention you rely on for their support. Mm -hmm. How do they get designed into the solution from afar on this rational basis? Okay, so you're not talk you don't mean the kind of beneficiaries, but instead the people who are like the teachers who are at administering the, um, and the... And their relationship with the beneficiary. Yeah, I mean, so... Um, yeah, I'm not sure, like... I mean, so in terms of the design of the programs, like with, you know, distributing bed nets and so on, it's always working with kind of partner organizations. And like, I think the ideals is like deworm the world, which is um, attempting to just kind of go into governments as well and say like, well, the, like, this is kind of what we know about this issue and so on. And then like ultimately ha just having it this kind of run by um, the kind of country itself. Like I do think it's a bad and fragile situation if like a significant aspect of um, healthcare systems just reliant on kind of aid. Um, and so the ideal I'd want is just something that kind of is, um, uh, that is sort of resilient to that. Um, but yeah, I guess, um, but then I mean the thing, like the thing I'm kind of thinking with like deworming or something, it's just, it's not that hard a program. So there's like not that much opportunity for co-creation. It's just like going around schools and giving out pills basically. Let's talk about deworming, okay. which is not a sentence you thought you'd hear, is it, tonight? Um, for those of you who haven't followed this story, I'm going to attempt to give a very quick summary mm -hmm. of, where, ha, of the, the yep, story yep. so far. You must please correct me if I get any of the yep, details yep. wrong. Prophylactic deworming okay, um, appeared to be the highest benefit, lowest cost intervention um, with a set of associated benefits like attendance at school and so on and so on. Right, have I got this right so far? Give Well, the organization that Will's been talking about, nominated it or described it as, as it were, an optimally rational intervention strategy if you cared about the reduction of infant mortality, the, the, the attendance of children at school, etc., 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 a bunch of good things. Okay. This was, am, am I right so far? This was held out to be um, uh, a paradigmatic example of the kind of approach that, that we've been talking about tonight. T 
two Cochrane reports, which are meta-studies, which are studies of all the studies, have since, again, correct me if I get this wrong, concluded that those interventions have nil observable positive effect. It's not that they have a negative effect, they have nil observable positive effect. Okay? And underlying this story is some quite complex, um, detailed um, uh, work on data, okay? on, the, on the handling of data in, in a number of different disciplines. Okay? How, do you, how do you address the deworming conundrum or crisis or, 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 or what, whatever, however you want to think about it. Okay, yeah. So the deworming, this got known as the worm wars, um, which is, shows you how cool epidemiologists are. Um, but yeah, so this was an issue. That, so we recommended, it's actually giving what we can originally recommended it. So sorry, back in, sorry. No, I mean, then GiveWell did as well, but after much arguing um, back in 2009. And so... Um, and then there's just been fairly extensive debate about um, what are the sizes and what are the effects um, of the impact of um, these, um, this kind of mass deworming program. I mean, definitely, so one thing we know is that these deworming pills kill worms. We know that for sure. Um, we also know that about a billion people worldwide suffer from wor like worms, which are kind of these like, foot-long worms that live in your gut. They're really pretty gross things. Um, so for me at least, what I'd call my prior, so it's just like my starting assumption, is that this is going to you know, be a benefit um, for the people, especially when you've got like a dozen worms in your gut. Um, but then the question is like, well, what does the evidence actually show? Um, and initially, um, it did seem to be the case. It's like, well, these huge educational benefits, huge kind of health benefits as well with this um, tiny amount of money. Um, but there's been a lot of studies, and so the evidence is at least a lot more mixed. Um, and there have been these two Cochrane reviews, which are meta-analyses of studies of studies. Um, and it wasn't that they said, we know there's no effect. It's more just, we don't think we have evidence to claim that there is an effect. Um, and you can go into a lot of detail and like, was these, were these actually good meta-analyses? They did some strange things, like they excluded a study for being underpowered, but the, it was underpowered in the direction of showing there was an effect, which is... Really, if something's underpowered, it means you're not going to find an effect either way. So you can kind of um, assess that as well. But I think it is the case that in deworming, um, so you know, bed nets, we can be really very confident that um, you're going to prevent children from getting malaria as a result of this, um, which is a, obviously a very large benefit. Give directly, um, you know, give people cash, they um, install metal roofs, that's... Um, you know, going to be like definitely going to be a benefit. Deworming is a bit more un un unclear. It's more like you've got some chance, and I think a reasonable chance of providing a benefit. And if you do, it's very great indeed, relative to the amount of money. Because the thing that's really interesting about deworming is not the size of the benefits, but just how incredibly cheap it is per person, about fifty cents per person. And so this kind of these kind of worm war wars have, um, you know, it's been a big fight between epidemiologists and economists. And I think it's in part a matter of the kind of concept that people use where the epidemiologist might say, well, we don't know that it has a benefit. <laughs> and I would say, like, yeah, that's totally right. And then the economist, and here I'm going to side with them, is saying, well, ultimately what we care about is just the likelihood of it having an impact and how big the impact would be. And so if it's like, well, do you, you do deworming, it costs 50 cents, um, 50 cents per child, and then it has like a 40% chance of increasing... Um, economic productivity by 20% over the person's life. That looks like this huge deal. It's like, okay, maybe it's a coin flip. We don't know. It's definitely going to have a um, positive impact. But given what we now know at the moment, it might do, and it might be very great. Okay. Um, in a minute, I'm going to ask, I'm going to open questions to the floor. But just while you're honing your perfect question, I'm going to, I'm going to give you one, one more. Um, if your reputation, your reputation as a movement, mm -hmm. is premised on this tough-minded mm -hmm. attitude to evidence, yeah. premise, and if premise, one of the things we know for sure is that we're, there's quite a lot of stuff we don't know, mm -hmm. which means that evidence is going to is a is a slippery, non-definitive, 
yep. never at the end of yeah, history yeah, yeah. thing. How do you develop a culture in your own movement of kind of rigorous mm. pivoting yeah. and honesty when stuff is uncertain or when it changes? Yeah, so it's a great, um, it's a really good question. I think it is hard because especially when it comes to moral matters, it's so natural to think, I care about this cause and I've invested in it so much. Like then to say, oh no, actually I was wrong. It was just, yeah. wasn't really doing much good. It's hard indeed. Especially and I when think people have voted their 10% of their Yeah, yeah, with the money, you'd have to money. acknowledge, like, maybe I just didn't use that money well in the past. And it has been the case, you know, we've recommended charities that we now say, yeah, that was maybe just not that great a use of money. And the same could be true of deworming. Maybe we get more evidence again, and then we think, no, actually now it's looking pretty conclusive that the benefits of deworming are very small indeed. Um, <laughs> in which case, we'd have to say, yep, we learned, like, this is part of what doing good is. It's actually really hard. Um, I think there's, so most of the time people develop, they develop their identities around certain causes. So they start to think, I'm an animal welfare advocate or I'm an environmentalist or something. And what I'm hoping with effective altruism is that you can develop a more meta identity. So I'm the sort of person who responds to arguments and reasons. I'm you know, what we call cause neutral. I'm willing to change my mind in the light of new evidence. And that's what I think of as my identity. And so, therefore, when I think, OK, no, I'm going to have to um, stop putting my efforts to this thing because I've learned it's not good and change, that's like a, um, a source of pride. And then, because we're developing this whole community, that you know, we'd hope would be something to be socially rewarded as well. And it's definitely hard to do. We definitely get these flame wars online between people of like, different stripes. But that's at least what we're striving towards. Interesting. OK, um, we would like you now to ask your questions. Can you tell us, tell us your name? Um, and could you uh, uh, use the microphone that, that uh, will come to you? Not because we can't hear you, but because the tape can't hear you. And we would like to be able to review your contributions to, the, to these sessions too. So the first hand up was somewhere over here. Yes, in the front row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sophie. I'm a PhD student here. My question is uh, about the more philosophical aspect of effective altruism. Are we losing something by using this sort of cost-benefit analysis to altruism, um, this instrumental approach <coughs> to human life? And relating to what you said earlier about my, how do the people that you are actually helping feel about this approach mm -hmm. to altruism? Okay, great. And then when you ask, um, are we missing something? Were you meaning, as in, we might be missing kind of ways of making the world better, or is it that you know it kind of robs altruism of its kind of Both. meaning? Okay, cool. Uh, okay, three questions then. <laughs> um, so, um, as for whether it robs um, altruism of its kind of meaning, I think there I feel pretty strongly a no because I think just the cause is that. Altruism is about making other people better off. Like, altruism is about beneficiaries. Um, and I really don't want to take a view where um, it really matters, kind of, how do I feel about this? I find that kind of, um, like, navel-gazing or um, even self-indulgent, especially given, like, given our place in the world, we're so incredibly well off. Um, we have su you know, such responsibility and opportunity to help others that... Um, thinking, oh, well, I ought to give because it's you know, making me a better person in some way. Even if that's true, I think that's not why we ought to be doing it. Um, with respect to whether it leaves out kind of things that could be valuable, I mean, one thing's definitely the case that it's just focused on welfare, so it's just focused on improving people's lives. And Effective Altruism deliberately chosen that as the focus for two reasons. One is that this is something that all different moral viewpoints can get behind. Um, one thing, any different, you know, obviously huge amounts of moral disagreement in the world. One thing we should all agree on is just, if you can make someone better off, that's better. That's just a good thing from the point of view of the universe. And the more people you can make better off, the better. Just helping five people is five times as good as helping one. Um, and then secondly, I think that in terms of the most pressing moral problems in the world, that does concern, um, that normally does concern welfare, you know, making people better off or worse off. But it does neglect some things. So um, you might think that biodiversity loss or species loss is bad in and of itself. 
not in a way that you can cash out in terms of um, uh, the instrument, because we can all agree that's bad instrumentally, bad for other people, but um, you might think, no, that's bad in and of itself, or you might think pursuit of knowledge is good in and of, of itself, or art is good in and of itself. Um, I ultimately think all of those things can be cashed out in terms of instrumental value, in terms of benefits to others. Um, but this might be one way in which you um, would say, OK, this is kind of effective altruism view as part of the truth, but not whole of the whole of the truth. Um, and then the final thing is, um, yeah, what do uh, the beneficiaries think? Um, and in general, like, yeah, very positive. Um, like, if you um, kind of do surveys, um, like on aid, for example, um, especially um, global health stuff, recipients are just like, yeah, this is great, and often have like much greater faith in um, uh, non-profits acting or NGOs and uh, acting in this area than they do in their own governments, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, similarly, in surveys done by um, sort of give directly, people are just you know, kind of as you'd expect, like very happy to receive kind of large amount of money. Yeah. Okay, I'll come back, I'll come back. Yes, I think my overarching question is, if you believe, and I think as the last slide suggests, that everyone should live according to those principles, because then I do actually think that they are a little bit dangerous. Because if each and every person would invest according to the principles that you've um, suggested, that would mean that no funding whatsoever would go into rather rare diseases. And that would mean that a person suffering from a rare disease will not get the same help than a person who suffers from a very common disease, as you suggested. Um, something that really hasn't convinced me, and maybe you can touch on that, is that um, if you can go back to your top five causes, they really don't reflect all of the examples or most of the examples that you've brought. Your examples were mainly from the health sector, but the top five causes to actually not fit into that category. Now, if you look into poverty, I guess it's way more complex than all the examples that you've brought. How does effective altruism apply there? How much money should we spend on evaluating the impact? And then again, you still haven't answered the question what we do with things where we can't evaluate the impact. And the last thing that I wanted to ask is how do you um, calculate the yalis for the animals? the second top cause. And what I want to say with that is that morals are in your model, but you don't touch on it, you don't elaborate on it. And that leaves me with the uncomfortable feeling, because who then decides? OK, there were quite a lot of questions. In, <laughs> in um, and, and I think you might have defeated my ability to synthesize them, but, but you, you, got the, you got a yeah. couple from OK, it. so there were definitely a number. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, like, What's in your model? Some of these like value judgments for sure. Like, what weight do you place to chicken suffering versus human suffering? It's you know a difficult philosophical question. Um, you know, we do investigation into like different theories of consciousness, rest arguments on either side, and so on. Um, but of course, there's going to be kind of value judgments coming in there. Um, point is not to shirk away from them, but at least make them explicit. And that's why kind of this question of different causes is so hard. Um, I mean, when the, the global poverty stuff, I was including global health under global poverty, so the reason I then didn't talk about poverty was then it was in the other causes. But then the core of, or the first part of your question at least was on rare diseases. So um, there's this question of, well, what if everyone did this? And my response is, only, is normally like, well, I wish I were that persuasive. Um, effective altruism is about thinking on the margins. So it's about thinking, what can I do given how everybody else acts? And in the way the world is at the moment, it's not the case. There's already lots of funding going towards um, a whole variety of different things. Funding is no way proportional to um, how many people are affected by these different causes. Um, and so that means when we think, well, given this, how ought I to act? Then we're going to start looking at what are the things that are biggest in scale and yet most neglected, um, which, you're right, may not be rare diseases. Though it could be if they were particularly underfunded. It would just be an empirical question. Um, and then the question is, well, what if everyone did this? And the answer is, well, we'd cure malaria and tuberculosis and um, HIV AIDS. It would be kind of amazing. Um, and then maybe it's the case that, um, even if it was the case that kind of rarest diseases were then not targeted, well, um, the question is just, we can't, I mean, we're, we live in this awful world where we can't help everybody. We just need to make trade-offs. That's like the fundamental question that effective altruism is addressing. If we could help absolutely everybody, 
then we obviously would. Um, that would be the right thing to do. But any action we take is going to help some people and not help others. And given that, the core principle of saying, well, if you can help five people and not help one, um, you can help you know, save five lives rather than save one, should save the five, seems to me to be pretty robust, pretty uncontroversial. And so in the case of these kind of rare diseases then, um, even if this was an implication of if everyone acted on effective altruism, I'm not sure that is, um, the question is like, well, is it unfair to those people? It's like, well, would it be unfair from, I think it's kind of irrelevant what disease someone is suffering from. The question is just how many people can you help? So if it would be unfair to this person suffering from a rare disease not to be helped, well, it would be unfair to the person who has the common disease who would not be helped if you focus your money on the rare disease. And if this one is really the case, that it's less effective, then there's going to be more people you're not being unfair to if you focus on the rare rather than the common. Yep. Well, thank you so much. It was super interesting and also encouraging to do things like that. So it was really nice. My question is related to the research methodology. Like in the web page, it says about uh, that you're measuring importance, tractability, neglectedness. So can you talk more about it? Like how, how, can, how did you measure it? Like what is like the economics or what is like the methodology behind this? And also in the web page, it says that uh, this is the highest standards. You have the highest standards of evidence to mm -hmm. choose these top charities. Uh, in, what, in, in what context do you make this strong assumption that this methodology is the highest standards? OK, terrific. Yeah, I just want to so distinguish the important scale and neglectedness from others. These are kind of like heuristics for choosing a cause, which is like a big area, like lots of different programs within a cause. Um, where um, neglectedness is measured just by how much money is flowing into this thing, this area, and the other sorts of resources. Scale is just how many people are affected and by how much. And then tractability is a bit more subjective, but you could think of it as how much money or how many resources would we need to invest in total in order to completely solve this problem. Um, but then, even if you pick a cause, there's still the question of what program do you focus on within that cause? Um, and so when we say kind of higher standards of evidence, um, we're not meaning the important scale and tractability. That's more like heuristics or rules of thumb. Higher standards of evidence is meant to be um, just the idea of using randomized controlled trials and preferably meta-analyses. Um, uh, those are normally described as the kind of gold standard rather than, say, using regression discontinuity or... Um, like just correlational studies or say anecdotes. So there's kind of a py pyramid of um, evidence quality and we're saying like, well, of these kind of top recommended charities like Against Malaria Foundation, these are the things that are supported by the evidence at the top of the pyramid like meta-analyses and randomized controlled trials. Okay, we've got lots of questions stacking up so I'm going to ask you to be really brief in your questions. Yeah. Um. Hi, uh, my name is Valentina Yami. I'm a PhD student here. I would like to... Keep your voice down. Yes, keep going. Um, I would like to ask a question about issues that are difficult to convince donors to put some money on, so difficult that are surrounded by stigma. Nevertheless, they are quite important, such as mental health. Mm -hmm. How would you convince and incentivize donors to invest on those issues? Mm -hmm. Okay, terrific. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the same, I mean, I think like deworming is about the least sexy development intervention there is. Um, uh, and I think this is like, yeah, the fact that some causes get so much attention, like the donkey sanctuary, um, despite not being any good, I think is like, a really bad reflection of most donors' kind of attitudes. Um, and so ultimately, uh, my answer is going to be, well, trying to cultivate more people who are giving in the spirit of effective <coughs> altruism. Um, because there, you know, the fact that it's deworming, being boring is a kind of plus, if anything, because it suggests that it's a neglected cause. Similarly, many people in effective altruism are concerned, you know, do think that mental health might be a severely neglected opportunity, um, especially in... Um, poorer countries where there's like very serious stigma about it. We're actually doing some research on this topic at the moment, especially related to suicide prevention. Um, uh, and so, 
you know, there I think one you know, strategy you could take, you might think, is, well, I just try and end the stigma around this thing. But I think a more, like, the more general one, one that would work for all sorts of stigma, is instead trying to get people to rather, do rather than donating on what's sexiest, but donate on the basis of what's actually going to help other people the most. Hi, um, I'm Jana. I'm a master's student here. Um, I have two questions. I'm going to try to keep them brief. Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. One is about um, regarding those cause neutral identities that you mentioned. And it's, it's just maybe more of an objection, I guess. But the cause neutral identity that you're hoping for, doesn't it imply a sort of a moral objectivity? And besides from the concerns around whether there is such thing, doesn't this limit simply the causes that you could plausibly support um, from that stance? And the second question is, there's a lot of talk about quantifying um, our, our contribution. These money, they go somewhere. Don't the people that affect those changes, don't they have um, isn't their contribution effective? Uh, and if not, how come? Why, why are we giving them money then? That's the qu question multiplier effect. You've got two there. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't actually think I followed all of your question, but um, on the like, isn't cause and reality, isn't that supposing kind of moral objectivity? Um, uh, answer is, I mean, I think not necessarily. Um, it's just saying that you know, even if you think ultimately morality is just about figuring out on the deepest level what do you want or what do you think you would ideally want to do. Um, it can still be the case that you can build an identity of saying, well, I want to be the sort of person who's just open to any way of doing good, like given certain assumptions. But the other thing is I actually just do think like there are just moral facts of the matter, like murder is wrong, rape is wrong, like no matter like who believes it or who says otherwise, like these things are just true. Um, and I think the same is true here. I mean, like, if we think of, um, you know, Woodrow Wilson or Abraham Lincoln, like, you know, people who are like proponents um, of the abolition of slavery, slavery um, if they'd said, oh, well, I prefer some other cause instead, like poor white farmers or something, we think they'd made a mistake. Like, we think we've made amazing progress um, in the past. And I think being having this attitude of cause neutrality is a way of driving forward kind of moral progress again. Um, co I think we better keep going. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Sean. Um, I think this is a question that you might get quite often, but I just would like to know what do you think about the role of international organizations like UNICEF, WWF, or Amnesty, and the different goals that like the United Nations sets. Like, How does that fit into the effects of altruism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we tend not to recommend these huge organizations just because they do loads of things. Some are going to be effective, some aren't. Um, and then the thing especially, and so you may as well just focus on the best things. Um, and then the thing with the UN in particular is you've just got this, so it's a political entity. There's so many competing interests. And it means that you get something like the Sustainable Development Goals, which don't really mean anything because... Um, they're not goals, or they're not priorities if you've just got hundreds of these things that represent every single special interest that's lobbied to kind of have them on the list. Um, and so, yeah, like obviously they're very important in terms of understanding the landscape of what's going on in the world, but, um, and I think, you know, in general they're good, but they're not the things where I'd want to focus my money or resources. Hi, I'm Frances. I'm a second year MPA student. My question is actually more on the philanthropy side. Um, and in my experience of philanthropy, people tend to give um, especially large sum donations as a form of building social capital. Um, you touched a bit on the identity side of it, but also as a way of kind of building social networks and connecting with like-minded people. Um, and if we're kind of opening up this philanthropy and trying to encourage as many people to uh, participate as possible, how can we sort of uh, leverage that desire to build social capital um, in a way that can work for people donating at all levels? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's definitely true a lot of people donate um, in order just to, um, yeah, like you say, like have a social network, um, 
I mean, also to kind of, you look like a better person if you donate and so on. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think I'm not really um, speaking to those people, actually. Like, um, I've had, they tend to be kind of, when I give talks like this or promote effective altruism, couple, just two classes of people, um, especially, you know, people who are interested in philanthropy already. There's the people who are like, yeah, oh my God, I like really just want to help other people as much as possible. And now, like, these are the numbers, this is, oh, like, these are the arguments, this is finally helping me. And if there's people who are interested in um, kind of building social capital, this isn't ultimately going to appeal to them, really, because um, uh, what if, so let's say, you know, give directly is the thing of the month, and so that enables them to build social capital. And then we think, okay, no, this isn't the most effective thing, instead it's worms, and that's not a very good way of building social capital. It's going to be kind of very non-robust to that reason. Um, having said that, like, the effective altruism community has like made my life way better. It's this like wonderful, um, amazing group of people that I feel like, you know, there's this tribe of people all gathered together in pursuit of a common cause. Um, and so it is like, as a side benefit, this immensely rewarding way to live. But I think of the sort of people you're thinking of, it's not that kind of community aspect isn't perhaps what they're, th what they're after. Okay, man at the back. Hi, I'm Yusina Laya. Um, I'm from LSE Effective Altruism. You've met me just before the talk. Um, my question relates to something you've mentioned before. You said um, it's already very difficult to measure the impact that um, that organizations have, which impact directly, like the Antimalaria Foundation, but much harder um, for other organiza organizations. I guess that applies, applies um, especially to um, organizations which try to have an indirect impact, for example, by influencing uh, parameters in society, raising av awareness for certain issues. And now, um, effective altruism has a priority list of, um, of, of organizations they deem effective. Um, and the most, uh, the, the, the organization um, ranked as most effective is the Anti-Malaria Foundation. So, uh, but um, is it based on evi any ev evidence or research um, that the Anti-Malaria Foundation is preferred, like, or that organizations having direct impact are preferred or should, should be donated to rather than um, other, uh, other organizations so which have indirect things. impact? Yeah, I mean, I think like, so if you were saying you were already funding certain areas of biomedical research, for example, like developing malarial vaccines and so on, yeah, I definitely wouldn't um, in any way confidently, I wouldn't want to like take money away from that and direct it towards the Against Malaria Foundation, for example. Um, I think of these things as like the baseline or the benchmark, like this is how much good you can be really pretty confident we can do. And then there's this question, can you do even more? Um, and so I don't think we can be confident that like this is the very best way of doing good. Though it is worth saying that GiveWell have investigated a lot the more speculative things and they actually think like AMF's this really unusually good charity. Um, so at least in terms of their subjective judgment, they think no AMF is particularly good. Um, I'm maybe I'm probably more open to the like harder to quantify causes than they are. Hi, Will. Last week we talked about cash exceeding innovation and creativity. And in the framework of evaluation, we haven't uh, really cash made cash exceeding a lot opportunity. Opportunity. Um, in this framework of evaluation evidence, we haven't really thought about those philanthropists who are interested in innovation or developing new things. How do you think that plays into your model? Mm. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if cash at the moment does exceed this. Like, you know, these deworming pills, bed nets, like, we've known about this for decades and they're still not funded. And so I often think that people can be too attracted towards, like, you know, gimmicky new things or, like, laptops in every school or something when we just haven't funded these incredibly basic things. And then I also just think that it's like really hard to beat cash transfers as well. And that has, you know, that could just absorb trillions of dollars potentially in um, philanthropic money. Uh, and so uh, I feel like I need to keep my answer short. So I guess my short answer is like, actually I think I deny the premise. I think that on the margin, just funding things that we already know work really well. And then maybe testing the things that are like already out there is going to be more important than, um, you know, trying to foster greater, like, yet more innovations. 
denying the premise this is a good philosopher's move next <laughs> we have to um, we have to speed up now because we're coming to the last six minutes so I'd ask you all to be snappy I think I know everyone who's got a question stacked up if we start to run out of time I'll ask you to put them all together and ask Will to to see if he can manage them all at the same time <laughs> go I'm Dana and my question has to do with how do you uh, deal with the effects of the I guess the negative facts really of measurement and so when you have measurement you're picking and choosing indicators and come what comes with that of course is performativity so you have companies and organizations then taking those indicators and then performing against those indicators so all of a sudden you have effects where you go into a house you open a closet and there's a stack of bed nets right we've all seen it those of that have been in these some of these places and so what do you do how are you dealing with that in your organization or company yeah terrific um so there i mean at the moment there's actually been very little incentive like remarkably little change from organizations trying to kind of get this funding that effective altruism movement has been moving, uh, which is surprising itself. Um, but then the response is just, yeah, looking at just, if you're looking at metrics, trying to get exactly the right metric. So saying number of bed nets sold is not good enough, and that's not what Against Malaria Foundation do. Instead, it's how many bed nets like are hung up, and they have like independent people come in and take photos like at a later date in order to see that they're like actually being used and so on. And so, yeah, what you want to do is, and then similarly, you know, even better is if you can actually just study like mortality rates, because that's ultimately what you care about. So yeah, the, the difficulty is just trying to get the metric as close as possible to what you ultimately care about, um, and not something that's kind of much further removed, which is a very common problem, I think. Thank you. As, uh, this is Shaquille, and I'm studying MSc here. Uh, my question was regarding sustainability of these initiatives. I mean, the charity programs on altruism are mostly, they are very personality driven, people who are very passionate about this subject. But what if, and I have seen like, you know, when, when the person who's kind of driving it is not no more there, this, this kind of programs really dries up. So I was just wondering how, how are you going to sustain this, this initiatives in the long run? Oh, so, I mean, in terms of funding, like, I mean, none of these, you mentioned personality driven, none of these um, uh, initiatives are kind of personality driven. I mean, at least in these kind of top charities, um, in some cases, at least it's, you know, sustainability. I feel like sustainability is not quite the right term. Like, even if it was the case that Against Malaria Foundation next year just lose all of, loses all of its money, uh, like, no one ever funds it again. It's still the case that you've done a kind of a huge amount of good in the past. And so in that sense, you're kind of just giving money to do good. And then it's not the case that everything falls apart if you don't continue funding it. Um, but then the other thing is just there is now enough um, effective altruist aligned donors that if you're doing something that's just really exceptionally good, there's going to be like a very large amount of money, money going behind them. So. Uh, hi, my name's Abbas. I'm LSE alumni and I founded a social enterprise. I mean, I've got a a number of issues with some of the things you said on behalf of founders, but I'll limit it to one very simple thing. Aren't you essentially ineffective altruism, given that if by your own standards, which is empirical measurement of impact, it turns out that charities you once thought were supposedly you know, high impact eventually become uh, non-observable impact or whatever it happens to be? Haven't you actually taken away agency from me as a founder in terms of impact in the causes that I actually believe in? You're actually ineffective altruism <coughs> rather than effective. Uh, I don't think I quite understood the objection. So, so you're saying that if the it's the case... The model is based on uh, empirical evidence mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. impact. Right? So if you have charities that you once thought, given evidence and then or lack of evidence were good, turn out to be not so good, yeah. then aren't you actually ineffective altruism? Because I could have used my capital somewhere else that probably would have had a better impact. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, if it's the case that the thing we recommend then turns out to be bad, which might well happen, then it is the case that, it, you know, if only we had known at the time, like, it would have been better. But this is always going to be the case. Like, we're always going to be just pit trying to figure out what's the best thing given our evidence. And we're just going to have to accept that the best judgments we make at the time, like, might turn out to be wrong. And then, but, like, if we go back, then the other thing that we could have done, not based on these principles, instead because of something that particularly spoke to us, in expectation of what's likely to happen is that's going to have even worse of an impact. 
Hi, my name is Sam. I'm in the Environmental uh, Economics and Climate Change Program. I'll be pithy. If instrumental value is sufficient, as you said, to value difficult to measure things like biodiversity loss, how do you balance the interests of animal rights activists and meat consumers? And in particular, does this impact the effectiveness of charity in the far factory farming industry? Okay, so you're saying that because there's animal, like animal welfare activists make meat consumers worse off because they don't get to enjoy tasty meat. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, if you just did the, like it's just gonna be such a small effect, like the difference like the gustatory pleasure that you get from enjoying meat is just like so tiny compared to the horrors that animals suffer on factory farms that even if you want to take that into account, it's just like, it's going to be pretty small, especially when like the health benefits seem to be like positive for being vegetarian. Right. We are at the point where um, if it, I'm going to take the last question and you already have the microphone then i'm going to see if i can pick up any questions where people have had their hand up and i've not noticed or had their hand up and i've forgotten that they've had their hand up i'm going to compress all that together and i'm going to ask will if he can answer those um, all in one go so anyone who who uh, is uh, desperate to ask we've got the first person there then we've got two at the top and one at the back. Those four people, okay? First. Hi, um, my name is Victoria. I'm doing a master's at LSE at the moment. Um, and I was just wondering, so you said when it's difficult to measure the impact of an intervention, that there's arguably, it's not so important, it's more about the probability of it doing well and either having a positive effect or not having a negligible effect. But I was just wondering how your model accommodates for potentially negative effects, uh, unforeseen effects that might actually damage recipient of that kind of intervention okay so uh, so how, how do you how do you guard against harmful effects hi will alex i work for philanthropist we met a couple of weeks ago um my question is hopefully a positive one uh, apart from winning a nobel prize if the top one percent of the world's population took this giving what we can pledge what would the world look like good question Yes. Um, could it not be the case that excessive foreign aid crowds out local innovation and creates dependency? If excessive what? Uh, foreign aid. So foreign excessive aid. giving. Going so if does foreign aid crowd out what? Local innovation. Okay. You know, entrepreneurship. Yeah, by yeah, the yeah, yeah. In the middle. Hi, my question would be, do you see any problem with monetizing uh, altruism in the way? Yeah. Okay. In the auctioneer mode. Okay. Going. Going. Go on. Right. Will, four questions. Okay. Th terrific. So I'll just answer them not quite in order. So monetizing altruism. Um, I don't think we are doing that. So the question is just making the trade offs that we face explicit. Um, and the way you do that is by saying, like, we have this fixed amount of resources. I can ha help this number of people or this number of people. Um, and in general, it seems like we want to help more rather than less. And um, the fact that you know, if it's cost-benefit analysis, you need to put um, uh, financial figures on this or quality-adjusted life years is just a way of like, making explicit what trade-offs we have to face. Certainly not saying there's some objective like, number that represents the value of a human life. Like, and if it w if there was such a thing, it definitely wouldn't be 2,000 pounds. It would be a lot more than that. Um, negative effects and you know, dependency. So one major negative effect of aid might be it clouds out institutions, um, prevents the, develop, the developing country from having better institutions. Um, yeah, risk of creating dependency as well. I mean, I actually agree that like, this is, like, for foreign aid in general, a really pretty big concern. Um, I actually am like, yeah, I'm pretty negative on an awful lot of foreign aid. Um, but there's like huge difference, I think, between foreign aid in general and the sorts of programs we recommend, in particular within global health, um, where the story by which these things are negative, I mean, so basically, I think the negative effects should be taken very seriously. Um, uh, certainly should cancel out benefits and possibly should be weighed like causing harm should be weighed more heavily than causing a comparative amount of benefit. 
Um, but then it f seems to me the stories by which um, these things would cause harm are like hard or um, like implausible when applied to these particular cases. And um, talking to people who are, you know, have the institutional critique of aid in general, I never find it that compelling with these particular cases. And you might worry about overpopulation, but like we've looked into that. Um, I don't think it's um, a big issue. Cash transfers, you might worry it just causes inflation. Again, kind of investigated that. Again, it doesn't seem to be a big issue. So in general, I'm like very concerned to it. I think it's a really big thing. Um, but then uh, when it comes to these particular organizations, I find like the stories you have to tell in order to make the harms very significant um, seem quite implausible. And then the finally is just, yeah, if, um, say if a rich just 1% gave 10% of their income, um, how good would that be? Well, if it was 10% of their wealth, um, that would be something like $8 trillion. Um, total cost to eradicate um, extreme poverty is about $200 billion per year. So we'd have eradicated extreme poverty, and then we'd still have the vast majority of money um, left over. I think with that, we could, um, yeah, with that amount of money, we could um, entirely move to a clean economy. Um, we could entirely eradicate factory farming. We could certainly deal with all the global catastrophic risks. And we'd probably have enough money to go to Mars back and back twice. <laughs> um, there's a huge amount of money out there in the world, a huge amount of money that could be used for good. And it's currently spent on cosmetics and ice creams. So um, I think if it ever does get to the case where that which is 1% will donate 10%, it would be a much better world. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much. <laughs>